Hi, everybody. I, um, I'm supposed to be at work today, and I decided to, um, I'm going to do some, I, I want to do a near-death experience encounter for you guys. I want to read something to you. It's, it's pretty much going to take up the whole episode here. Um, this is important. I, it, it touches me very deeply, and I get a little emotional, too, when I read this, so bear with me, because it, it just it really chokes me up when I read it. Um, I just got done reading it to my son, actually, but I was supposed to be at work about three hours ago, and I just felt I was in my spirit that I was supposed to read this today. So um, there is a story a woman had named Angie Fenimore, and she decided one day she was going to commit suicide. She lived a really hard life. She was um, Her mother, I think, had passed away when she was young. She ended up helping to raise her, her siblings and ended up with her father sexually, um, you know, molesting her. And then she grew up into, uh, marrying a man that was abusive as well. So her life was really hard for her. And she got to a point where she felt that if, um, she just ended her life, her sons would be better off. Her husband would be better off, you know, just everybody would be better off. And so would she, and she just, I, she had had, her mother had had an experience when she was in the hospital, she had died um, during surgery, and she, when she had died, she had seen God. She had had an experience with it and come back, and so she told Angie about this experience, and it just, it kind of preyed on her mind, and she started feeling like she just wanted to die and be with, with God or be in this light that her mother had talked about. So it gave her thought to, you know, I guess, dwell on suicide for quite a while until she ended up one day finally doing it. So I'm going to read her story to you. Angie Fenimore's Suicide Near-Death Experience. Angie Fenimore, a wife and mother haunted by abuse in childhood and overwhelmed by despair, was in a desperate state of mind. On January 8, 1991, she committed suicide hoping to escape her sense of emptiness and suffering. But clinical death didn't draw her to the light seen in so many near-death experiences. Instead, she found herself in a realm of darkness. The hell she experienced was far more horrific and personal than the old fire and brimstone metaphors. Her hell was a realm of terrifying visions and profound psychic disconnection. Miraculously, she was restored to life, imprinted forever with a new sense of faith, of being subject to the sacred will, and of being truly a child of God. The following is an excerpt from her wonderful testimony. Angie writes, I was passing over into a different sphere. My soul was disconnecting from my body with a hum that kept growing louder rising to a whine as the vibration of death pulled me deeper. I noticed that there was a large screen before me. I was being drawn into a three-dimensional slideshow of my life that played out before my eyes chronologically. While I, while I experienced every part of it from all points of view and all points of understanding. I've heard that before and I find that very fascinating that when we pass away, we will experience our life not only from our eyes, but also from everybody else's. Like whoever you're interacting with, you're going to feel everything that they felt as well. And I think that that is just so incredibly just and right. I knew exactly how each person felt who had ever interacted with me, she writes. In particular, however, I was being shown in vivid detail exactly what my childhood was really like. The pictures flew past me, but I easily absorbed every moment, each one triggering an entire an, each one triggering an entire memory or a chunk of my life. So this was what people meant when they said my life flashed before my eyes. I think the childhood part she experienced was um I think our childhood influences our life so much and I believe that that's why more time was taken with her childhood. The closer I came to the end of my life, the faster the pictures flew past me. It was incredible. 
In an instant, I had experienced the entirety of the 27 years from my birth until the moment that I found myself dying on the couch and passing into the warm tunnel. Then the fast motion of my life rushing past and through me stopped abruptly. Now what? Where was I? I was immersed in darkness. My eyes seemed to adjust, and I could see clearly even though there was no light. The darkness continued in all directions and seemed to have no end. But it wasn't just blackness. It was an endless void, an absence of light. It was completely en enveloping. I swung my head around to explore the thick blackness and saw to my right, standing shoulder to shoulder, a handful of others. They were, te they were all teenagers. Oh, we must be the suicides, I thought. With a laugh, I opened my mouth, but before I could form the words, they came tumbling out. I wasn't sure whether I had thought the words or had attempted to say them, but they were audible without my having to move my lips. Then I wasn't sure if these other people had heard me until the guy next to me responded. He didn't say a word to me. He slowly looked down at me and turned forward again. There was absolutely no expression on his face, no warmth or intelligence in his eyes. Suspended in darkness, he and all the others stood fixed in a thoughtless stupor. Second over from the other end of the line was a girl who looked to be in her late teens. I was coming to see that feeling, what some called intuition or the sixth sense, was the preferred method of transferring information here where unvoiced ideas were, grew audible. As I exercised my new power of sensing and feeling, I had an inkling that I was remembering a long-forgotten, natural, familiar skill that had been supplanted or subverted by words, and I quickly grew proficient at this new way of gaining knowledge. But she did not connect with me, her empty gaze fixed on nothing, continued uninterrupted by my thoughts about her. She was just like the rest of them, staring blankly forward with no concern or curiosity about where we were. They were dead, and so was I. <clears throat> Suddenly, as if we had been waiting for a kind of sorting process to take place, I was sucked further into the darkness by an unseen and undefined power, leaving the teenagers behind. I landed on the edge of a shadowy realm, suspended in the darkness, extending to the limits of my sight. I knew that I was in a state of hell, but this was not the typical fire and brimstone hell that I had learned about as a young child. The word purgatory rose, whispered into my mind. Men and women of all ages, but no children, were standing or squatting or wandering about on the realm. Some were mumbling to themselves. The darkness emanated from deep within and radiated from them in an aura I could feel. They were completely self-absorbed, every one of them too caught up in his or her own misery to engage in any mental or emotional exchange. They had the ability to connect with one another, but they were incapacitated by the darkness. I gradually became aware of the sounds of a kaleidoscope flurry of voices and I realized that in this realm, thoughts were the mode of communication. Around me, I could hear the buzz of thoughts as if I were in a crowded movie theater with lights down low, picking up the sounds of hushed exchanges. I want to say that um, I know that supposedly our abilities to communicate telepathically have been... I, I don't know how to, I guess, you know, drained out of us or put to sleep by um, fluoridation and all the toxins. And, you know, Satan had a, a plan to, to make sure that we didn't know how to use our abilities and we have them. That's why there's some people that have the ability, you know, to be psychics or mediums, things like that. People can see and feel things that we have these abilities. The same goes for the um, telepathic communication. One of the reasons that we have to learn how to rein in our thoughts 
is because in the afterlife, our thoughts are just like saying something audibly. You know, it's the same thing. If we think something when we're in heaven or whatever realm we're in, after we pass, it becomes very audible for everybody to hear. So it's, I always call this, and I've said this before, like we're in college for life here. Like we're, we're in college here to learn how to be good people for our next life or, you know, to see what we choose. And this is very important. So just, you know, if you can work on really trying to rein in how you think about things, because in the afterlife, it's just like you're talking. It's, it, there's no difference. So that's very important. But we have, we've had a lot of our abilities have been taken from us and we've been like a veil has been put over us to put, you know, putting people to sleep so that we don't know what we we're capable of. And this is just uh, one more example of it. So sitting next to me was a man who appeared to be about 60 years old. This man's eyes were totally without comprehension, pathetically squatting on the ground, draped in filthy white robes. He wasn't radiating anything, not even self-pity. I felt that he had absorbed everything there was to know here and had chosen to stop thinking. He was completely drained, just waiting. I knew that his soul had been rotting here forever. In this dark prison, a day might be might as well be a thousand days or a thousand years. That's the other thing. There, There's supposedly no sense of time. When we pass into heaven or another realm, we, there's no sense of time. You don't know, you know, you, 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 you don't feel a passage of time like you do here. It's not the same. I was sure that this man was like the middle-aged woman had killed himself. His clothing suggested that he might have walked the earth during Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. I wondered if he was Judas Iscariot who had betrayed the Savior and then hung himself. I felt that I should be embarrassed that I was thinking these things in his presence where he could hear me. As my mind reached for more information, I felt tremendous disappointment. I could feel and completely know about everything around me just by posing a question in my mind or by looking in any direction. The possibilities for learning were endless, but I had no books, no television, no love, no privacy, no sleep, no friends, no light, no growth, no happiness, and no relief, no knowledge to gain and no way to use it. But worse was my growing sense of complete aloneness. Even hearing the brunt of someone's anger, however unpleasant, is a form of tangible connection. But in this empty world where no connections could be made, the solitude was terrifying. Then I heard a voice of awesome power, not loud but crashing over me like a booming wave of sound, a voice that encompassed such ferocious anger that with one word it could destroy the universe. And that also encompassed such potent and unwavering love that like the sun, it could coax life from the earth. I cowered at its force and at its excruciating words. Is this what you really want? The voice said. The great voice emanated from a pinpoint of light that swelled with each thunderous word until it hung like a radiant sun just beyond the black wall of mist that formed my prison. Though far more brilliant than the sun, the light soothed my eyes with its deep and pure white luminescence. I sensed that the light could not, or perhaps would not, I wasn't sure, cross the barrier into the darkness, and I knew with complete certainty that I was in the presence of God. He was a being of light, not just radiating light or illuminated from within, but he almost seemed to be made of the light. It was a light that had substance and dimension, the most beautiful, glorious substance that I had ever beheld. All beauty, all love, all goodness were contained in the light that poured forth from this being. But there is nothing that we are even capable of imagining that comes close to the magnitude of perfect love that this being poured into me. While I was not remembering details of a life before my mortal birth, I was reacquainting myself with the life that I shared with the Father 
a spirit life that seemed to extend to the beginning of the universe. I could see that none of the others in the realm were aware of God's presence. The man cowering next to me could see that I was focused on something, but it was apparent that he couldn't see anything beyond the barrier. Others contained, or I'm sorry, others continued to babble unaware. Then God spoke to me. His words were excruciating. Is this what you really want? Don't you know that this is the worst thing you could have done? I could feel his anger and frustration, both because I'd thrown in the towel and because I had cut myself off from him and from his guidance. And I'd felt trapped. I had been able I had been able to see no other choice but to die before I could do any more damage in life. So I answered, but my life is so hard. My thoughts were communicated so fast that they weren't even completed before I observed, I absorbed his response. This is funny to me. This answered something for me because, um, a lot of times I'll talk to God and I always hear him answer me in my right ear. It's always on my right side. And I had questions about that. And later on, I found out through doing some research that other people that hear God's voice always hear him on their right side, which is, it's, it's, you know, interesting because Jesus sits on the right side of God. So there's something God has with the right side. And I've noticed many times when I've talked to God that during the, like, I'll be talking, I'll be in, a, in the middle of a sentence and before my sentence is completed, he'll start answering me. And I'm like, but I haven't even finished my, my sentence yet or my thought yet. And I just, he just, he just comes right in. It's like, he just, boom, starts answering. He kind of just talks right over you and knows exactly what you're saying. So it was pretty, it was pretty neat to hear that. You think that was hard. It is nothing compared to what awaits you if you take your life. When the father spoke, each of his words exploded into a complex of meanings, like fireworks, tiny balls of light that erupted into a billion bits of information, filling me with streams of vivid truth and pure understanding. Life's supposed to be hard. You can't skip over parts. We all, we have all done it. You must earn what you receive. This is incredible to me. This is the part where Jesus steps in. She and she realizes that Jesus is speaking and what he says here is so profound to me. I'm going to read this again so everybody can grasp this. Jesus says, life's supposed to be hard. You can't skip over parts. We have all done it. You must earn what you receive. I think that that is incredible. Suddenly I felt another presence with us, the same presence that had been with me when I first crossed over into death and who had reviewed my life with me. I recognized that he had been with us the whole time, but that I was only now becoming able to perceive him. Then I'd sensed his powerful yet gentle personality, but now I could feel him so strongly that I could even ascertain his shape. What I could see were bits of light coming through the darkness like t tiny laser beams pinpricking a black sheet or like stars peeping through the blackness of a cloudless night. It's, it's funny because God's light, he didn't penetrate the blackness. He stayed away, most likely because he wanted to. But Jesus' light penetrated with little tiny beams, and I think that's amazing. This light was unmistakably of the same brilliance as the, as the glorious light that emanated from the Father, but my spiritual eyes were incapable of fully beholding it. My ability to see with my eyes was somehow linked to my willingness to believe. Her willingness to believe was the reason why she was able to see. The rays of light penetrated me with incredible force, with the power of an all-consuming love. This love was as pure and potent as the Father's, but it, it had an entirely new dimension of pure compassion, of complete and perfect empathy. I felt that he not only understood my life and my pains exactly 
as if he had actually lived my life, but that he knew everything about how to guide me through it, how my different choices could produce either more bitterness or new growth. Having thought all my life that no one could possibly understand what I had been through, I was now aware that there was one other person who truly did. Through this empathy ran a deep vein of sorrow. He ached. He truly grieved for the pain I had endured, but even more for my failure to seek his comfort. His greatest desire was to help me. He mourned my blindness as a mother would mourn a dead child. Suddenly I knew that I was in the presence of the Redeemer of the world. He spoke to me through the veil of darkness. Don't you understand? I have done this for you. As I was flooded with his love and with the actual pain that he bore for me, my spiritual eyes were opened. In that moment, I began to see just exactly what it was that the Savior had done, how he had sacrificed for me. He showed me. He had taken me into himself, subsumed my life in his, embracing my experiences, my sufferings as his own. And so for a second, I was within his body, able to see things from his point of view and to experience his self-awareness. He let me in so I could see for myself how he had taken on my burdens and how much love he bore me. And I knew where I had gone wrong. I had doubted his existence. I had questioned the authenticity of the scriptures because what they claimed seemed to seemed too good to be true. I had hoped that there was truth to the idea of a savior who had given his life for me, but I had been afraid to really believe. To believe without seeing requires a great deal of trust. My trust had been violated so many times in my life that I had very little to spare. And I think a lot of us have that problem. And so I had clung to my pain so tightly that I was willing to end my life rather than unburden myself and act on the chance that a Savior existed. He wanted to comfort me and to hold me, but we were separated by my responses to the lessons of life. He had been there for me all through my life, but I had not trusted him. As I watched from the Savior's perspective, his unique comprehension of my predicament was transferred to the Father. From my new perspective, I saw God in profile as he was looking at my form. The father and his son's communication was so rapid, so perfect, that they seemed to think each other's thoughts in unison. Jesus was pleading my case. There was no conflict or argument here. Jesus' understanding was accepted without dispute because he had all the facts. He was the perfect judge. He knew precisely what precisely where I stood in relation to my need for mercy and the universe's need for justice. Now I could see that all the suffering in my mortal life would be temporary and that it was actually for my good. Our sufferings on earth need not be futile. Out of the most tragic of circumstances springs human growth. And that's true. We do not grow unless we are going through trials. People do not grow when things are going well. That is the truth. As God the Father and Jesus were teaching me, their words picked up speed and power and then merged so that they were saying the exact same things in the very same moment. They shared one voice, one mind, and the purpose, and I was divulged with pure knowledge. I learned that just as there are laws of nature, of physics, and probability, there are laws of spirit. One of these spiritual laws is that a price of suffering must be paid for every act of harm. That is, that is profound. One of the spiritual laws is that a price of suffering must be paid for every act of harm. I was painfully aware of the suffering I had caused my family and other people because of my own weaknesses. But now I saw that my ending my life but that by ending my life, I was destroying the web of connections of people on earth, possibly drastically altering the lives of millions, for all of us are inseparably linked. And the negative impact of one decision has the capacity to be be felt throughout the world, 
because one person gets affected, then they affect a person, then they affect a person, then they affect, it goes on down the line. This is exactly fact. If you, every time you do something that's hurtful or harmful or wrong, you're, you're grieving the Lord. You're causing him pain and you're also causing pain that can be felt. I mean, it can affect millions of people by the time it's all done. It just, it just goes down this whole chain of people because everybody then reacts to that, you know, whatever behavior that you put out and then they react. And then, so their reaction gets felt by another person and on and on and on it goes. This is incredible. My children certainly would be gravely harmed by my suicide. I was given a glimpse of their future, not the events of their lives, but rather energy and the character that their lives would have. By abandoning my earthly responsibilities, I would influence my children, my oldest son in particular, to make choices that would lead him away from his divine purpose, because we're all born with a divine purpose. Before Alex was born, I was told he had agreed to perform specific tasks during his life on earth. Do you understand this, people, what this is saying? Before her son was born, she was told that he had agreed to come here to earth and perform specific tasks during his life on earth, which means we are in the presence of God before we are born. Our souls agree to do things before we come here. And then what happens is we get here and then Satan and his crew disrupt things. They make, they lead us astray from our divine purpose. They cause conflicts and pain and confusion. It's even said that the person we're supposed to meet, like our soulmate, the person we're to be mated up with, that they actually put wrenches in the works with that causing us to never meet the person or to constantly miss each other. And then, and then he throws other people into the mix. And, and this is, I mean, I've heard this many times. His duty was not revealed to me, but I felt the energy that his life would have up until his young adult years. I was told that my children were great and powerful spirits and that, uh, and that up to this point in my life, I had not deserved them. I caught a glimpse of how deeply God loves my boys and how with my callous disregard for their welfare, I was tampering with the sacred will of God. Then I was shown how I would harm other people close to me, such as my husband and my sister, Tony, by taking my life and by extension, countless others. There were people on the earth whom I would never meet who would be affected by my suicide because of the chain reaction. Because of the anger and pain I would cause them, my loved ones would be unable to store up the goodness that they were meant to pass on to others. I would be held responsible for the damages or the lack of good. So it isn't just what we do. It's also what we don't do that we're held responsible for. It's almost like when we're supposed to you know, witness about God. We're supposed to give testimony to others about the Lord to get them saved. If we don't do that, it's written in the Bible that their blood could be on our hands because we missed opportunities to testify to them. Even if you testify and you don't win their soul at that moment, you're still planting seeds. You're planting seeds of salvation and every seed that gets planted into their heart and their soul and their mind adds up into at one point, they might come to the Lord because of all this, because of all the times they've heard about him. There might be that one time they do. So it doesn't matter that you're not running around just saving souls on the spot. You're still planting those seeds. So get the word out to people. So she says, I would be held responsible for the damage or the damages or the lack of good they would do while immersed in the pain of my selfish death. And I would pay dearly for it. Since spiritual laws dictate that all of the harm, including lack of good, stemming from my death, be punished by a measure of suffering. Even though I couldn't foresee the ripple effect my death would cause, I would be held accountable. God himself is bound by spiritual law, and so there could be no escape for me. 
So God is actually bound by the laws of the spirit. And if he's bound, that means there's no way that we could escape it. Sorry, I'm taking drinks in between here. Give me a second. And I was shown that for me, the realm of darkness was quite literally spiritually. Okay, let me start over again. And I was shown that for me, the realm of darkness was quite literally spiritual time out. A place where I was supposed to grasp the gravity of my offenses and to pay the price. But I had to ask, why me? Why was it that I could see God while the vacant husk of a man next to me could not? Why was I absorbing light and being taught while he was hunkering down in misery and darkness? I was told that the reason is willingness. When I first looked at that man and wondered if he had been alive during the earthly ministry of Jesus, the question showed that I was willing to believe in God, willing to believe that Christ had once walked the earth. And once I was willing to believe, I was able to see. Willingness and ability are the same thing. All around me on the dark realm were people of varying degrees of willingness, willingness, and some weren't willing at all, and of understanding and of ability to see that Jesus Christ was there with us the whole time. I don't know if the others were talking to God as I was, or if they were talking to other messengers of light that I was not yet capable of seeing, but I'm sure that not all of them were just mumbling to themselves. And I could see that my spiritual time out could have lasted a moment or it could have taken me thousands of years to progress out of that dark prison, depending on when I reached the point of willingness to see the light. And what about the spiritual law that required me to suffer for the damage I had already done in life up until and including my suicide? I was told that the debt had already been paid, that the sacrifice had already been made in the Garden of Gethsemane. I can never pronounce this. The Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus Christ had experienced all the suffering that has or ever will take place in the life of any human born on this earth. This is something I did not know. I did not realize that when Jesus was in the garden, I know that he sweat tears, or he sweat drops of blood and cried tears of blood. And now I think I understand why, because according to this, God showed her that Jesus, that all the suffering that mankind has ever endured was poured into Jesus that day, that night. That is just unimaginable. He experienced my life. He bore my sins. He accepted my grief. But in order for the agony that Jesus endured on my behalf to count, in order for him to take my place in fulfilling that spiritual law, I had to accept his gift. My heart broke as I realized that I had been not only hurting my family, who are beloved children of God, but also causing my Savior, who had such all-encompassing love and compassion for me, to suffer all because I had allowed myself to be molded by other people's weaknesses. So anybody that's dealing with a person in their life that is causing them pain or anguish or emotional term, you know, emotional turmoil, anything, if you're going through like home lives that are home lives that are just rough, you know, just know that, we're kind of all going through stuff and it's just something that we have to realize that other people like they're the stuff that they're dealing with. Like if you're living with an alcoholic or a drug addict or a narcissist or, you know, people like that do not let their weaknesses and their shortcomings or what they're dealing with affect you to a point where it stops you or it, or, or it, you know, keeps you spiritually bound don't let this happen. Overcome it. Think of yourself. Think of what you can do to make you strong. And when you're dealing with that person, think about how Jesus would want you to act when you're dealing with them. And just keep him close to you by your side at all times. Keep Jesus next to you, near you. Stay close to him because when you're dealing with a complicated person like that, that you, you feel is really dragging you down, whether it's 
you know, a spouse or a child or, you know, a parent or whoever it is, a friend, a roommate, whatever, just, you know, try to get through it and, and know that you might be there for a purpose for that person, you know, that, that just keep trying to show them Jesus's light through the way that you live and the way that you handle them even. And it's, it's actually a good testimony and witness to God. So just remember that I, I live sometimes, you know, with my mate, it's really hard at times. And, um, you just have to keep persevering and keep praying. And like I said, stay close to the Lord. He'll, he'll let you know what to do. Now my perception was shifting and the darkness seemed to lift slightly. When I first entered the dark prison, my vision took in only the things and the people in the realm of darkness. But once I had taken enough light in from God and Jesus, my spiritual eyes were open to another dimension in the darkness. Now I could see that beings of light were all around me. Hell, while also a specific dimension, is primarily a state of mind. When we die, we are bound by what we think. In, mor in mortality, the more solid our thoughts become as we act upon them, allowing darkness to develop in others and in ourselves, the more damning they are. I had been in hell long before I died, and I hadn't realized it because I had escaped many of the consequences up until the point that I took my life. But when we die, our state of mind grows far more obvious because we are gathered together with those who think as we do. This ordering is completely natural and is consistent with how we choose to live while we are in this world. Our time is but a heartbeat in the eternal scheme of creation, and yet it is the crucial moment of truth, the turning point. It determines how our spirits will exist forever into both the future and the past. Something I want to say here. Give me a minute. I have to take a sip here. I'm drinking a slushy. Um, I read this book. I've talked about this before. It's called The Bible and the Bermuda Triangle. And this was a really good book. I read this book when I was about 16 years old. My dad had it actually. And everything about the book was backed up by a Bible verse, every theory that it had. So it was pretty fascinating. In one part of the book, it talked about how this person had gone into the realm of hell. And what they witnessed was that everybody that was there was being tortured by the God they served on earth, meaning whatever they were obsessed with the most. Like if you were a gambler, you would, or you were somebody that was really greedy, you would see money and you would continuously want to touch this money. You would be compelled to touch this money over and over again. And every time you touched it, it would burn you. Um, and, and it was like this with anything, anything that you loved on earth that took you away from God, took you away from your purpose and that pretty much consumed you like an addiction, like drugs, alcohol, um, gambling, you know, sexual addictions, anything, you would be compelled to repeatedly do the act that you love over and over and over again, but you would be like burned by it or tortured by it in some way. So this actually falls into, kind of falls into step with what that book said as well. Okay, let me go on here. I was becoming less and less a part of the place of darkness with each particle of light that I accepted. I hadn't felt myself lift off the surface, but now I was hovering above the field of darkness into the realm of the scurrying spirits of light. I could feel the urgency in the spirits who were scurrying about to do the work of God. I was then told that we are in the final moments before the Savior will return to the earth. I love this. She saw the final moments that, that we are in the final moments before Jesus comes back. This is amazing guys. I was told that the war between darkness and light upon the earth has grown so intense that if we are not continually seeking light, the darkness will consume us and we will be lost. I am kind of emphasizing this. So if we, she was shown that the darkness has basically encompassed the earth, the war has grown so intense and that if we are not continually seeking light, the darkness will consume us and we will be lost. I was not told when it would happen because nobody knows that, not even Jesus, only the father, 
but I understood that the earth is being prepared for the second coming of Christ. I looked down at the pathetic souls and realized that I no longer felt as they did. I wanted to live. I am just, it just, it's so amazing to me that she got to feel that, that it's actually, they're in preparation. I saw, I had seen something, a testimony one time where a person was talking to God and they said, and he said that all of heaven, it, I don't know if it was God or if it was an angel. I can't, I can't remember. It was, it was a, it was a heavenly being. And they said that all of heaven was on its feet preparing for the return of Jesus. And I am just like, wow, this is amazing. Then the powerful energy source that had transported me to the dark prison returned to liberate me. For a split second, a rushing sensation engulfed me. The darkness sped past, and suddenly I was back in my body, lying on the couch. And that was her testimony. And I felt I had to share this. I actually, I was heading out the door today, and I was ready to go to work. And I felt God just, Tracy, I need you to put this up now. Because there might be a soul that I could touch at a certain moment that God needs me to. And I know that, you know, you guys like to hear a lot of um, the cryptid stuff and the supernatural things. But I've, I've made it really clear that I am a very strong Christian and I am very close to God. I've had amazing encounters with God, things I will tell you guys about. Um, I will, you know, I will start talking about some of the things that's happened to me. I, I did already. I've told a couple of the stories. Um, but I just, I, it all goes hand in hand to me, the spiritual battle, the cryptids, the, the war between good and evil, the demonic presences that we're seeing, the, the demons, the spirits, the dogmen, the, the Bigfoot. I feel that, you know, there's people that are having these encounters with aliens, with Wendigos, with the rake, with dogmen, you know, with mothmen, with, with reptilians. And as soon as they invoke the name of Jesus, people, these beings disappear like a flash. And that's telling you something. Okay. This, this is intensified. It's picking up more and more and more. There's more and more cryptid sightings. There's more and more supernatural things going on. It's coming out. They're coming out more and more. And this is stepping up and, and, it's escalating big time. So that is why I felt the need to put this up today. Um, I hope it was a testimony to anybody that's a non-believer. And I, I respect anybody's, you know, beliefs. I'm not going to push mine on anybody. I don't feel that that's necessary. I, I hope that you enjoy, you know, this episode and that you get something from it and, and, you know, don't find offense to it. But I really felt the need to, to, to put it up. Well, I guess I'm going to see what's going to happen today with the rest of the day. It looks like it's going to rain. I'm having just a really big cheat day here. Thanks to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but I love you guys. And um, if you need to communicate with me, just drop me a message. Um, I'm at in the dark 2021 at gmail.com. Just send me a message. Send me your stories, encounters, near-death experiences, cryptid sightings, anything you guys have. Please send them to me, and I will read them on the show. You guys have a wonderful rest of your Sunday, and I will be talking to you soon. Take care.